landing as we're coming in here, um, which is always nice and proof that we are live. And uh, today I want to say that we are so proud to be brought to you by the Family Resource Center and the San Juan Island Community Foundation. So thank you to those two absolutely important organizations in our community. They're vital. Um, I am also I'm copying and I'm about to paste in the feed here Ta -da, a little link. And that link is because you know three people who are incredibly talented who should have who should share their talents with us. So I want you to share those to share their talents um, with me so that I can reach out to them. <laughs> And, um, and if you, so tag a friend in the comments, join on the form, um, and we'll, and we'll get you on here. We've had just a blast with our guests so far over the past few days. And today I'm bringing in an absolute island firecracker in the flesh. Here she comes. Three, two, one. Winnie. <laughs> I win. <laughs> So today you are going to kind of take us on a little olfactory tour mm -hmm. with yes. Facebook. I mean, with Facebook, with um, virtually through Friday Harbor yes. Live. Excellent, live. excellent. And if you could scoot, I think it's a little bit to your right. That might this be. Way? Yeah, this yeah. Okay. That would be awesome. So um, yeah. that is great. So I am, there we go. Um, so today um, you're going to do that with us and take us through kind of some different terminology that we're going to learn um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of how this all works and why yeah. they're so important. What else? I'm going to give you a tour of my little studio, my lab, which as you can see is kind of involved. So let's start, um, first of all, and I wonder if you're able to put up figure one, Val. Yeah, you betcha. Are you put up this handout? Yep. Okay, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm gonna act as if you can. And um, one of the things that uh, a perfumer has, as everyone else has, is a nose, right? We all have a nose. And there's a common uh, misunderstanding about talent. In many art forms, people say, oh, someone is very talented. Um, and honestly, if you, if you want to take that down for now, Val, that would be great. Um, so we say that someone is very talented. But in reality, um, it's about training. And so when I, um, when I decided to train my nose, what I did, because I'm on an island, is I went sort of to the tippy top of the game. And that guy's name is John Claude Elena, and he's a perfumer for Hermes. And Hermes, Hermes, is um, one of the first companies that took an in-house perfumer. So he's an artist, and they hired him, and they sell what he makes. And that is not a common way of perfumery, but I'll get into that a little later. Anyway, all that to say, I read his books, I listened to everything that he said, and then I tried to do it. And the way that we um, think about molecules, or I'm sorry, about scent, is we have the scent stimulus and we have the receptor. And the scent stimulus is a molecule. And the scent receptor is what we call our scent experience has a certain flow. And so here comes something that has an odor and it is made up of molecules. So the way that we smell something on this side is that the molecule has a weight, it lifts through the air, it travels up the nasal passage mixed with air, and it gets into the olfactory epithelium. So I have said on the handout that the olfactory epithelium is essentially the eyes you know, eyes don't know anything except to bring something in. And so the olfactory epithelium brings in the, the response from the molecule. And then the next step in the brain in this process, the molecule comes in, 
it's received by the olfactory epithelium, and then it goes up to the olfactory bulb. And this essentially is a, a bunch, of, this is very shortened. It's connecting nerves to the brain, and the, the um, scent experience is experienced in the limbic system. And the only other experience that is translated in, in the limbic system is emotion. And that is why if you're 100 years old and you go back to your elementary school and smell it, it is going to transport you back to how you felt when you were, you know, at elementary school age. So um, that, is, that is why whenever we smell something, we might have an experience with it or we might not. And one of the things I love about scent is um, the experience of the emotion that comes with it. So um, if you, let's see. So for example, the molecules that come in, um, they, you've heard of top, middle, and base notes. And the top notes are essentially molecules that are small. So you mix small molecules with heat and they lift off quickly. So citrus is, for example, a smaller molecule. And I won't go into the science of it because I'm not super well read about it. But there is a huge chemistry factor that you don't have to know in order to play around with perfumery materials, but it's helpful later if you want to make a living at it. Secondly is the mid note or the heart note. And those molecules are of a middle size range. So as you can imagine, there's sort of a larger, um, let's see, you can use mid notes in a, in a more effective way. We call it the heart of the fragrance. So if we're mixing a fragrance, we want it to be smoky, then we find mid weight molecules that are smoky. That's just an example. And then you have what we call the base notes and base notes are heavy. So they lift off more slowly. They have more what we call tenacity. That means that they stay on the skin longer. And um, so you have the top, the mid, and the base. And um, most perfumes are sold on the top note. So you go into a department store, or nowadays you can go into a duty-free store, and you smell it, and the top note is what you're gonna get first. First of all, you should never smell perfume straight from the bottle because it's mixed with ethyl alcohol and the ethyl alcohol hits your nose and turns you, you know, turns your um, olfactory epithelium off essentially. And whatever gets through is what you get. So you should always spray it on a blotter, wave it, and then smell it. But you'll still get the top notes because those are the ones that are gonna come off first. So keeping in mind the size of the molecule, the molecular weight, if you're on a snowy day, we say, oh, I love the smell of snowy air. The reality is because there's no heat, there are no molecules lifting off into your nose through the air and all the molecules, molecules fall down to the ground. So you're literally smelling nothing. Just as if you were smelling, say, a piece of metal the molecules do not lift off of the metal very easily. So if you wanted to explore scent, first of all, we all have a scent library in our minds. If I said the word cinnamon, you would have an idea of what cinnamon is. If I said lemon, you would call to mind lemon. Um, you know, if I, if, if I said any number of what we call in the industry gourmand uh, molecules, you would have an idea of what they smell like. So if you were gonna go out and smell in the world, one of the things that you would you know, do is be really conscious about how you smell. And I learned this from a guy named uh, Rudnitska, Edmund Rudnitska, and he was the guy who trained Jean Elena. And he said, do it in the morning after you've had a little bit to eat, you go outside. And when you're smelling something, and I'm just gonna give you an example of a scent strip. This is a scent strip that I make out of acid-free paper. You put your material on the scent strip and you close your eyes and gently smell it. And the most important thing to do if you want to grow your scent library 
is you want to pay attention to what your, your brain does with that material. So I'm gonna give you an example of a pine tree. We've all sort of smelled sap, right? The proper way to smell sap for the very first time, because when you smell something for the first time, it has, um, it goes into your library. So you wanna be very intentional about it if you're trying to train your nose. So for example, sap, you would take some pine needles, you grind them up a little bit, and then quiet down silence your mind a little bit and bring them up to your nose and smell it very intentionally. So you're not going and sniffing, you're, you're just smelling intentionally and pay attention to what your mind does with it. Is it happy? Is it sad? What color is it? How does it feel? How does that scent feel if you were to touch it? And we might say prickly, but you know, it might be a soothing, warm feeling. So that's a, a way to start making your scent vocabulary. The scent vocabulary is very, oh, it's deep and wide. There are many, many people out there that um, they actually divide on how something should be described. So that's something you can do. And then, um, I don't know, Val, I, don't, I actually don't even know if you can hear me, Val. Um, I am not hearing you. There, I can't hear you, but in any event, this is an, uh, another PDF that I put together. And this PDF is um, the materials that are dominant compounds in citrus, because my guess is that your library has citrus in it. You know what lemon peel smells like. And secondly, you know what pine smells like. And interestingly, pine and citrus have a very important com um, component that is um, in common, some pine and some citrus. All the citrus has limonene in it, and many pine um, compounds have alpha beta pinene. And pinene, you can imagine, that's why it's called pinene, because it's got this material in it. And the way that um, the way that the perfume industry learns how to cultivate and manufacture materials is by essentially breaking them down into their, into their dominant um, elements. They break out the chemicals through any number of methods, and we can talk about that another time. But for example, orange peel is almost 98% limonene. So I have limonene here, and I have synthetic limonene, because limonene isn't the only thing in citrus peel. There are other molecules, but I don't need those other molecules in order to make a perfume that I want to smell orangey. Because um, let's take, for example, the rose. A rose may have up to 200 molecules in its essential oil, but there are only four that make up the common element for every rose. So this little exercise right here where, oh, it's on the screen. This exercise here where you can smell intentionally the peel of an orange and then smell intentionally the um, smell of some pine needles that you've ground up in your hands. If you do it intentionally, you will be able to smell the alpha and beta pinene that's in the citrus and the limonene that's in the pine needle. So there's, there's some overlap there, right? And so I, I went ahead and um, broke out, my face is covering it on the screen, but I broke out some of the major fragrance materials that are in just many, many modern fragrances. They're citronellol, citronellol, it's an alcohol, so it's a top note, geraniol, phenylethyl alcohol, or we call it PEA, cis rose oxide and cis and trans rose oxide. And those are, um, those are just major, major materials that are in most fragrances that are sold um, in the marketplace. Now, there's a big discussion about that, about those materials. There's a big discussion about natural materials versus synthetic materials. And some people, I, I honestly can't tell you how many times people have said to me, oh, I can't wear perfume, I'm allergic to synthetic perfume. 
I can only wear naturals. And I'm not saying that they're not allergic to synthetic perfume or perfumes that have synthetic materials, but really from an organic chemistry point of view, there are thousands more molecules and so therefore thousands more opt, um, opportunities to be allergic to naturals than there are to synthetics. The synthetics are highly regulated, we're self-regulated, and if um, something causes a reaction to skin, generally speaking, of course the um, regula regulatory bo bodies bump it way down so that they can minimize the amount of reaction that someone might have with a material. So there's a huge conversation about natural versus synthetic materials. The way that the synthetic materials are manufactured are sometimes as a byproduct of other materials, for example, orange juice, what do you do with the peels? You squish them and you come up with essential oil, right? And of course, uh, orange juice, you know, like oranges are in a lot of food products, so there's no shortage of orange peel in the world. So that's something that can be kind of managed. But if you think about, for example, sandalwood, patchouli, vetiver, any number of the musks, those are um, very difficult. Um, and if you put up the other, the natural versus synthetics, this PDF, Val, thank you. You'll see that I've kind of listed out the reasons. So naturals versus synthetics. Natural materials, essential oils that I know that many of you are familiar with, they're very complex. They have hundreds and sometimes thousands of molecules in them. So they are, um, well, there's more opportunity for allergy with the naturals, frankly. Synthetics are simple molecules, phenyl ethyl alcohol. If I were to give you a strip and let you smell it of phenyl ethyl alcohol, you would go, oh, what is that? What is that? I recognize that. And then I told you what it was from it's in many flowers, but every rose, you would go, ah, oh, a rose, because your brain knows phenyl ethyl alcohol, even though you don't know that it knows. And then another thing about naturals is they're really just almost impossible to produce sustainably. And many countries have been destroyed for their frankincense, for their sandalwood, just decimated. You know, the, the market comes in and just essentially takes everything. So you have big companies that take sandalwood, pure sandalwood from whatever region. I don't know, I don't know exactly how they do it, but they take that material and they isolate out what is what of this material makes it smell like sandalwood. Let's make that. And come to find out that sometimes that is a byproduct of another industry. It's already being made. So with naturals versus synthetic, for example, in, um, the impossibility to make it sustainable. I mean, some people are trying to um, with a measure of success. It's very difficult and we know that if something is difficult, it's very expensive. So if something is difficult to make consistent, it's gonna be expensive. If, it, if it's difficult for it to be, um, you know, protected against the elements, disease, weather, it's gonna be expensive. So synthetics, for that reason, are just highly less expensive. And the last thing about naturals that I'll talk about today is the inconsistent product. So some companies have made this commitment to natural materials. They don't use synthetic materials. One of those types of companies was um, Aveda. Aveda's perfumer decided never to use unnatural materials. Uh, the problem with that is they couldn't keep making the shampoo that everybody fell in love with because they couldn't get the materials. And so I think it was L'Oreal purchased Aveda and they went towards the synthetic and they got the market segment back and they, they make a consistent product that really does smell exactly the same as the one that was made in the natural. So that's, that's interesting to me and compelling and it's very, um, it's highly debated in the perfume world. So that's all I need of the, um, of the PDFs, Val, and I would love to answer questions if there's a question. Um, otherwise, we can just take a tour of the studio.
and I can't hear you, so I don't know if I'm. Um... I know it's always hey. <laughs> So, um, no, and what happens is um, people are stopping by and saying, hi, Tracy Wilson joined in and Sue Turnbull. So, um, and and um, someone who I don't recognize from the island named Jill was just letting you know that she could hear you. And um, let's see, who do we have right here? Oh, yeah, Sue's in there. So, so hi, Sue, and seven other people hi, whom I can't identify. So, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, take us on the tour. Okay, so um, I, I, I'll just preface everything that I'm saying this way, and that is simply that I am a beginning perfumer. I don't know anything about perfumer. There are so, or about perfumery. I mean, I know three years worth, and there are people that spend their entire lives studying perfumery and that are ace in, um, in chemistry land. You know, they're, they're, a lot of them are hired by the manufacturers of the materials, um, I wanted to bring up one more thing that's kind of interesting to me, and that is about what we call a linear perfume. We talked about the top heart or middle and base notes of a perfume. Um, the first linear perfume was in response to um, the changes that have been made or the changes that have happened to the perfume industry. And Basically, uh, perfume was a product for the um, elite. You know, the elite were the ones that um, bought perfume. You know, the lower socioeconomic classes didn't have expendable income to buy perfume. And so what they would do is they'd go to the parfum LA and they would put on a sample or somebody would make something for them and they would take it home and they would follow it through the top, middle and base and see if it was for them and take a lot of time figuring it out. And then they'd come up with a signature scent for themselves. Well, you know, fast forward through synthetic production and all the things that have happened with gas mass spectrometry, spectrometry and um, these are machines that can debunk and figure out what's in anything. Um, basically, uh, what's happened with perfume is that the industry couldn't uh, risk a perfume changing on the skin. So, for example, the first linear per perfume is a perfume called Tresor. It's by Lancome. And when you put Tresor on your skin, it stays almost the same, almost exactly the same when you put it on as when you go to bed. It has a long, um, long life on the skin, which is we call tenacity. It's not super perfu profuse. Per perfu Perfusive, so it doesn't like slap people in the face. Um, the perfumer was a master. It's called the Grossman Accord. It's only made up of four different materials that are superbly balanced. And so, so that's a big change in the perfume industry is someone really knew what she, she really knew what she was doing when she balanced the four materials and made this beautiful linear perfume. It's sort of like a color field if you did a painting of red we would call that a color field. And she, she did a scent field of four very popular and powerful materials that was just a home run. So I'm gonna take you to my studio and I have to spin the camera around. Uh, wish me luck. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Nicely done. I'm impressed. Okay, so of course you've noticed um, behind me, this is called the perfumer's organ which i don't like to call it i prefer to call that the library and there you'll notice that it's behind this piece of plastic because inevitably when i mix um scents you get a tiny tiny bit that's on the outside um of the bottle and then the whole room just smells like gobbledygook it doesn't make sense at all and so all of these are arranged by um alphabetically so i have some knowledge of all of these materials. That means that when I'm making a scent, I think, oh, I need to get some herboxane because that's going to pop up the basil. Or I need to pull in some cedar wood, but not cedar wood atlas. I need to pull in cedar wood Virginia because I want it to be smoky or whatever. You, you spend a lot of time studying materials. And then what you do is you come up with a formula. You write it out on a sheet and you get out all of your materials and you line them up according to the percentage that's in the vial. So I'll take a vial 
or uh, in this case, a beaker, and I'll put it on my scale, and it's impossible for me to show you exactly, but I'll take a bottle, reading, reading the um, formula, and I'll load this up with as much of that um, material that I think that this scent is gonna need. And so in this case, I'll show you, I was making um, an amber smoky um, pine thing because I'm doing a collection of Northwest scents and this one is called Cedarwood and Campfire. And so of course I put in fir balsam and I put in Western cedar, but I also needed it to be kind of smoky. So I put in some Cade oil and some clear wood, which is kind of smoky. And this is a material that is really wonderful for me. It's uh, bee propolis. And I discovered that it has an incredible, sweet, rich, sort of burnt honey scent. And I just can't stop using it. Um, let's see. I want to find a material that, um, okay, syringal. So this is a synthetic material. As you can see, I use the naturals, but this is a synthetic material called syringal which is the synthetic for guaiac wood. So that means that a bunch of guaiac wood trees do not have to be cut down and squeezed out or whatever they do to get the wood or the essence out. Um, some of my materials, for example, this one is called indole. And indole smells so bad that you just want to start crying. Like literally this stuff smells so bad that you, Everyone on the planet hates it. But if you put, this one is in 1% dilution. If you put just one drop into a fragrance, it can flower the whole entire thing. So my perfumery teacher said, pay special attention to the materials that you hate because they'll become your best friends. So that's kind of hard to believe, but I do it. So there you have it. There's my scale. I have here, this is my, um, this is my garbage can because you spent a lot of you spend a lot of time mixing materials and then you put too much of the cade oil in or you put too much of the something in and it doesn't work. So you have to dump it out. So really, truly, all of this stuff is destined for the garbage unless I kind of hit on something. So right here, what I have are a bunch of uh scent trials and I've got all the formulas and spreadsheets they have to be perfect so that you can replicate them and I've got these scent trials right here I have salt air and sea mist and I think this is number this is number three and then I have salt air and sea mist number two this is a um this is a thing to hold lipstick that I got on Amazon here's salt air number five those what those are doing is macerating and macerating is a, a word we used um, to it's essentially cooking you I'm, I'm using these days for these materials to the molecules to blend together because they change they change just a little bit and if you ask some perfumers you know what happens when you macerate this with that they almost always say it gets better so if you like one of your scent trials and um and let it macerate for a couple weeks. Um, and you, you can almost invariably think that you're gonna like it better. You can just know that that's gonna be the case. So, um, let's see, I have a lot of um, bottles and vials. These are some bottle samples that I have. And um, so I get to mixing and I get to making up collections. This is my um, Northwest scent collection. I got mossy rocks, campfire and cedar, salt air and sea mist, and then sweet coffee. Those are what I'm working on now. And um, yeah, I'm a nut for buying bottles. I, I just buy tons of bottles because I, I just buy the samples, not tons of bottles, but I am just crazy about them. So that's my hobby. And some people buy it, they keep me in the money to buy the materials. These materials are mostly synthetics, so they're affordable. And um, that's what I got. That's about it. So much. I mean, seriously, who knew? And I've yeah. had a tour of your studio before, like in the flesh. So, but I learned so much today that I did not know. I can be careful of the sense you don't like.
Who knew that? Yeah. Well, uh, he said, you know, pay attention to them because they're going to become your best friends. And, you know, th we even have a category of scent, oddly enough, is fecal. So this is, you know, if you're not a perfumer, if I say something smells a little bit fecal, you'll go, oh, that's disgusting. But what it does for us is it describes a, a group of scents. It, it describes the category in which a direction of a scent is going. And so, yeah, there's, a, there's balsamic, woody, green, um, tannic, piney. I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of fragrance terms. And so in and something I, like, I really like um, vanilla E scents, yeah. the scents that have mm -hmm. a lot of vanilla. And so kind of what I was learning today is they probably don't have vanilla in them. They wouldn't have natural vanilla in them because it just doesn't make any sense to put natural vanilla in anything. They have, that was one of the first um, materials, which is called vanillin. Where is it? It's in use right now, so I don't know where it is, but it's called vanillin or ethyl vanillin. And it is the synthetic exact molecular identical, um, it's Make molecularly identical to the vanilla that you get out of a bean that you have to grow, that you have to go get, that you have to, you know, protect because it's um, expensive. And, you know, ethyl vanillin actually comes from turpentine. Turpentine has so many molecules in it. It's a natural, it has so many toxic molecules in it that they're able to isolate them out. So we call them a terpene. That is you know, really it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. That is and really I cool. I love the ability to be bored. I love to, I love to drill down on stuff and that's what I've done. And what you have to know about Winnie is that, you know, if by per chance she's done with her fragrances for <laughs> half a second, she can turn about 180 degrees and she has an art studio there. Yeah, <laughs> I paint and you know, it's, it, it's surprising to me. The whole thing is surprising to me. I think I started perfuming because I was too scared to paint. I really do. I think that I could paint with scents. It's very similar. You're blending things. You don't know exactly what's going to happen when that happens, you know, um, but nobody's going to see it. It's just you and your nose. And so I will show some paintings because um, you're here. Well, and, and some really cool is happening tomorrow for San Juan Island. Yeah. Do you want to share about that? Yeah, so we're having a live uh, virtual art walk because I have a, a lot of friends and all we do is paint. We just paint our brains out and I, I perfume in the morning because um, typically um, the, sen of, the sense of smell is more active in the morning. Um, yeah, so I, I, I paint with scent in the morning and then I paint with paint in the afternoon and we're having a virtual art walk tomorrow if you put, I'll get on any um, social media and put in hashtag virtual art walk, S-J-I-S. There are dozens of us and we're just going to be like trying it, you know. I think it's a great out. idea and what a cool way yeah. to just jump in in such an easy way and support our brilliantly talented local artists. So tomorrow, and we have another one on tomorrow. We have Paula West here tomorrow. Oh, who good, is, yeah. yeah who's so talented as well. Yeah. And so, um, Winnie, thank you. Thank you thank for being you, here Val. today. It's been really fun. And if anybody has any questions or if they want to come to the studio, I invite them to just reach out to me on Facebook or wherever. I could talk about scent all day, happily. It's a good thing. And you have to cut, you have to smell your scents. Um, help me with the name of it. It's, um, is it my daughter's sweater? My favorite sweater. My favorite sweater. <gasps> you made oh, it for your daughter. Sweater. I made it for Wilsey so that I could say, what do you mean? I gave you my favorite sweater. And it kind of took off and we're doing a rebrand. I'm doing a rebrand in spring because really I, I'm truly just a hobbyist. But then all of a sudden I, I like looked at the books and I sold a hundred bottles of perfume last year. So I was really surprised because I just, it was just fun. And um, they need and to look cooler and not fall down. And so good. It's so Thank good. You. Thank you. It took a long time. I probably did uh, 60 cent trials on that. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. Well, it was worth it. Just, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And we hope to have you back again. 
Okay, happily. <laughs> okay, take care, Winnie. See you later. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, again, this is Islanders teaching kids of all ages across the island. And again, thank you to the Family Resource Center and to the Community Foundation for making this episode of Friday Harbor Live possible. We're really grateful. And thank you for all you're doing to support our community groups at this time. Um, to all the kids out there of all ages, Thanks for joining us. Tag a couple friends in the comments who you would like to see on here. And um, you never know, they might be on the next episode of Friday Harbor Live. See you later. Bye-bye.